Um, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. I'm very happy to see that there are so many participants. I'm Claudio Persello. I'm co-chair of the Image Analysis and Data Fusion Committee of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Community. I'm delighted to host this webinar and introduce our three excellent speakers today. Before that, I would like to um, spend uh, a few words of introduction. So this webinar is part of a series of webinars on Earth observation for the Sustainable Development Goals. And is a collaboration between uh, two technical committees, IADF and REACT. The next webinar is already planned for the next uh, month. So stay tuned because we will soon uh, announce the, the date and also the speakers and the topic. Uh, the idea of this uh, series of webinars is to connect the scientific community orbiting around GRSS and IADF with organizations and people that are actively involved in the SDGs and monitoring the progress towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, let me uh, quickly share my screen. I just had a, a few slides. I would like to share. Is this visible? I hope so. So um, today we focus on SDG 11, which aims at making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. More specifically, we will talk about mapping slums or deprived urban areas, which are which is a topic linked to indicator 1111. And as you can see, just to give you an order of magnitude of the societal challenge we are talking about, according to current estimates, there are 1 billion people living in informal settlements or, or slums. After this uh, introduction, I will give the floor to each of uh, the speakers. We have three speakers today, and they will present, they will give a presentation of about 15 minutes. And in the end, we will have time for a discussion and questions. So also during the presentation, uh, you can already uh, write your question in the, in the chat. <clears throat> Let me um, introduce the, the three speakers for today. So our first speaker is uh, Monica Kufer. Uh, she's working and as an assistant professor at the Faculty of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation, ITC at the University of Twente. And her main research interests are about urban remote sensing, SDG monitoring, mapping deprived areas, and analyzing urban forms and dynamics with remote sensing and spatial statistics. She is co-chairing an international network on the privation area mapping called IDEA Maps. And she's currently working on a number of projects related to deprived area mapping. <clears throat> Our second speaker is Giulio Pedrasoli. He is professor and researcher at the Federal University of Bahia, working at the Department of Transportation Engineering and Geodesy of the Polytechnic School of the Federal University of Bahia. He uh, develops research using remote sensing to identify patterns of spatiotemporal change over the Earth's surface especially in mapping urban sprawl and the relationship between housing and poverty in the global south. And he is currently coordinator of the mapping of Brazilian urbanized areas in the Map Biomas Initiative. Our third speaker is uh, Denis Vaniki. He is a spatial data expert at UN Habitat and analytics section, where he coordinates activities around geospatial data production methodological development and supporting countries and cities in the integration of earth observation and geospatial information into urban monitoring processes. He currently leads UN Habitat's global activities on production of data on three SDG 11 indicators, which are reliant on earth observation and geospatial information. Among the other activities, he also contributes to the preparation of progress reports against SDG. 11. 
So I think today we have really a very nice setup of speakers, which allows us to put in contact um, the views uh, from academics, but also from agency like UN Habitat, which is um, well actively, actively, actively involved as a custodian agency for SDG. But um, with this, I would like now to move to our first presentation, which is given by Monica Kufer. So Monica, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Claudio, for having us and having me and are very pleased to present the work we do on using Earth observation data and methods for mapping deprivation. Um, and I will have my presentation. It's a bit of a split of um, making you understand when we talk about uh, deprivation, what we mean by deprivation and also the challenges of uh, producing data on deprived urban areas and um, um, and generating data across uh, very diverse cities. Um, and I will draw examples from a lot of the ongoing research I'm doing together with colleagues. Uh, Claudia already mentioned Idea Maps, which stands for a large network of uh, people working, not only earth observation scientists, but also community mapping groups and more um, um, like um, ground based mapping initiatives um, and other work we are doing within Slum Map, which is more earth observation based mapping. Um, and I want to give you a bit of an um, overview of the complexity of mapping. Um, I won't go into um, terribly much detail, so you will find always links to specific papers on the slides if you're interested in very specific details or you can contact me about it. So when we talk about uh, the massive urbanization and the challenges, and Claudia was already referring to that we have this massive degree increase of, um, of urban population, and it's also expected to grow even much further. You have um, cities which are having um, um, almost exponential growth rates, uh, cities that are surpassing, in, at least on the agglomeration level, of 20 million people, which are very challenging of managing and also providing housing. Um, so what we see is that the majority of the expected growth is not happening in the areas which are the, um, um, let's say, the very planned um, and well-serviced urban areas, but the majority is happening in particularly in uh, low and mid-income country cities, and the uh, vast majority will happening if nothing is done in in deprived urban areas. When we refer to deprivation, but I will go on in more details what we, how we define deprivation are areas which are deprived in terms of living conditions, services, infrastructure, so people typically lack what are sort of standard living conditions in cities. Um, when we talk about, um, and I think um, Dennis will come back to this in more, much more detail, when we talk about spatially targeting poverty, we need to define two, two concepts, and that's what I was already saying, it's like the whole co concept on, and the different concepts used are very complicated, and when you develop mapping um, methods and instruments, you have to be very clear what are you mapping. So what is a very common definition and starting with the definition of a slum, which was defined by UN Habitat, but it's a household level concept. So it's what a household lacks, for example, in terms of assets, incomes, um, in housing material, UN Habitat defines it with water, sanitation, tenure, overcrowding, and also some locational aspects. Um, but what we very much advocate that besides this household level deprivation, um, another aspect of deprivation is the location um, of a household within an area. So a whole area is how, how is the area connected with the rest of the city? Um, how densely built up is this area? And that's what we very much advocate that needs to be added to the household level concept of deprivation to have a more holistic understanding of deprivation and also to develop mapping instruments that reflect um, this aspect of deprivation. So what we have been doing um, um, 
Um, and that's also what I really want to encourage Earth observation scientists when you start developing mapping instruments um, and mapping methods that you think about what are actually the user requirements. So what, what, is, what are user needs um, to really develop um, useful products? So what we did is in this um, example, we did a user survey with a large, um, very diverse user communities to understand what is actually required in terms of mapping outputs. And what we concluded um, is that um, this area are rapidly changing. So you really need updates, for example, every um, one or two years. Um, there are also massively ethical challenges. So what should we put on maps? Are there, can these maps be also harmful? Um, should we aggregate information um, not to show the highest level of detail and therefore, we also went for what you also will see in some of the upcoming slides, gridded mapping approaches, which are not, which are not showing exact boundaries. Anyhow, exact boundaries are very, um, are full of uncertainty, how you draw the boundary, where's the boundary of a deprived area. So therefore, gridded mapping systems are more suited. They're also easily linked with other existing global data set like population data sets. And another aspect which also is shown when we talk about slums, informal settlements, deprived areas, um, um, we should only not only map what is missing, but also what are the assets of the area. So what are also the development potential of an area? So what are their capitals to also to, to, to increase um, and to grow? Um, I just want to show one example of the power of spatial information. It's a recent example of um, November last year. We did some uh, data collection in Nairobi, and there was one area which was evicted. Evicted means um, overnight bulldozer came, kicked out the inhabitants. Um, all the houses have been cleaned, um, and the inhabitants were um, not informed. Um, they were protesting against, um, and we started then to mapping and to also show the extent of the demolished area. With some colleagues, we also got it in um, in the main Spanish newspaper. It also gave, got into uh, The Guardian. And this caused a lot of attention that then it was sort of uptake, uptaken, that um, that this, at least this um, demolition was declared as an illegal demolition, um, which shows the power of mapping and the generation of, 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 of spatial data. And that's kind of initiative we also do together with uh, a group that Dennis is um, one of the main funders, uh, funding fathers of this group. It's the SDG toolkit, uh, toolkit where we are trying to um, uh, compile data that are useful for SDG 11 indicator monitoring. And it's a toolkit which is not targeted to Earth observation scientists, but it's produced by Earth observation scientists by, for government users, for NGOs, for local users who have easy access to Earth observation data and tools. The big part of this toolkit is that SDG 11, one indicator on slums and former settlements, uh, data, um, there are some data related to it, but there are not real data sets in this toolkit that can support SDG 11.1.1 monitoring. Um, what is the problem of, um, of uh, having such data available ha um, has to do with um, um, the mapping is conceptually really complex because what um, is defined as um, a slum informal settlement uh, relates to aspects which cannot be di directly seen in images. They can be used, extracted as proxy indicators, for example, in terms of densities, um, arrangement patterns, um, sort of the abs absence of, of road, um, of access roads. This can be as proxies and can be used as proxy indicators for mapping approaches. So what we are doing, and that's also possible, like in this example from Slum Map, we are producing data sets that are um, using such proxy indicators in a credit system, uh, showing the probability of a grid cell of being deprived and also adding information like population, um, build up densities, um, um, available of open spaces within a grid cell that are um, then accessible to users. 
Um, we also look into the question of uh, local systems, because if you want to have a global map, and that's what SDG needs, global mapping systems, um, you need to uh, solve the question of low-cost mapping system. And it's an example comparing uh, low-cost data sets spot uh, with a free-cost data set. And what we show, at least in the like in the case of Nairobi, but we also run it over other African cities, that um, you can do quite a lot with free cost data, like a combination of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Um, um, we also developed a whole conceptual framework of characterizing deprivation, which is using a combination of earth observation data and other geospatial data, which are openly accessible. So a big issue is really building it on data sets that are available across countries. So what you see in this mapping framework is that um, there are different domains. So there are a total of nine domains um, linking to the household level deprivation, to area level deprivation, to how areas are connected with the rest of the city. And each domain, for example, co uh, contamination, is building on indicators, for example, air pollution, uh, garbage accumulation, and indicators can be extracted sometimes with earth observation methods like air pollution can be extracted, for example, with Sentinel-5P data or garbage accumulation. I will show a later example how garbage can be mapped with earth observation data. And they build indicator, uh, indicators to produce overall city level deprivation map, which you see here as an example that you uh, map cities from the least to the most deprived areas. They, begin, they can be by local users put into thresholds and combined, for example, uh, with population data for SDG monitoring. Such pilot outputs, here the example of Nairobi, um, are in a moment under production to see how this sort of data framework can be implemented with Earth observation data combined with other openly geospatial data. And what you see for those who are from Nairobi, you see very strongly sticking out some of the most uh, prominent deprived urban areas like Kibera. But you also see this east-west divide, um, which has to do with a long-term colonial planning policies, which goes back to the colonial period, where, where there was a strong urban divide in, in the city between the um, east and the west part of the city. We are looking also into generation of uh, population data and um, using deep learning methods to uh, to model population data with Sentinel data being trained in one city, being applied to another city, and basically using um, the urban morphology as a predictor of population data, knowing that existing models, population models, in particular on the deprived urban areas, often only um, capture sometimes 10%. There are studies in some African cities showing that about the 30% of the real population is captured. So uh, between 90 to 70% of the population is missing in population models, which is a big issue for, uh, for um, uh, SEG reporting. So we also look into, yeah, the transferability, which is a big issue, and the, uh, with, because urban um, form characteristics of deprived urban areas uh, differ very much across cities, um, shown here in the example of few cities on the different urban morphology, and this has to do, of course, a lot with how to develop models to make them transferable, um, and um, that's an initiative um, what we are in the moment working on to make them and to pilot them in. A sample of cities of different sizes, also a lot of the data on Earth observation data often done on more bigger cities. Um, what needs to be done to, to, to train such model, we need massive data, massive reference data, and typically Earth observation data are generated by, um, by Earth observation scientists and not by, um, by the people on the ground. So often this data are, um, so what, what it, irritates me sometimes if I see studies having like 90% accuracy and the data are separate as sort of the reference data are produced by visual interpretation of the image interpreter without ground checks. So what we are trying to do is really we 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 trying to use citizen science methods uh, like in this example um, um, having hundreds uh, like total of one million image pairs compared by people living in deprived urban areas, producing locally grounded um, 
training and reference data, but also data that describe the difference in urban environments, like um, um, like a deprived area is not the same as another deprived area, but uh, there's much diversity in characterizing different types of deprived, deprived areas in terms of um, um, spaces, open spaces, uh, the environmental question, and one important environmental question is um, the, the fact of the massive accumulation of waste in communities, which is contributing to flooding because it uh, blocks drainage systems. It contributes massively to environmental um, um, and health conditions of inhabitants after each flood. Um, particularly children are get terribly sick because of all the waste which is flowing through the settlements and mapping this massive problem and uh, trying to develop so local solutions is an important first step. So I'm stopping, I've been talking already too long. Um, you see uh, like some small video impression of this waste data collection study we had in Nairobi done. Um, and um, there are a lot of other resources available. So if you're interested in it, please let us know and get in contact with us. Um, so as, in a nutshell, I think we need to advance our spatial knowledge on the urban complexity of understanding deprivation, not as a binary phenomenon, phenomena, but also as an um, sort of a, the variation of deprivations and developing policies based on, on grounded data, um, and particularly the harvest, harvesting the massive knowledge from community-based information. My last slide is, um, if you're interested in urban remote sensing, uh, there's uh, the website is today um, went public, so uh, maybe you'd like to join us for the next um, Joint Urban Remote Sensing Conference next year in uh, Greed. Thanks a lot. Over to you, uh, Claudio. Thanks a lot, uh, Monica. Very interesting overview of a number of activities. And um, yeah, I would, I, I see already a question. Um, we have maybe a few minutes to reply to one or two questions, then I would like to move to the next speaker. There will be more time at the end of the three presentations than to uh, answer two questions, but I will pick um, maybe one. The first question I see, which is how can we use deep learning and machine learning in land use and land cover for detecting change in agricultural areas? What type of data, what sort of software to use? I would um, say, um, yeah, deep um, learning I'm not a used. For... I think it's more a question to you, Claudio, because you've actually could be, could that, be. agricultural areas. So let's say for, for our urban uh, land use, land cover mapping, um, so I, I, as I said, I didn't bend into technical data. So the study in, in Nairobi you saw, um, which is this, um, what we use within SlumMap, the um, um, probability of a cell to be deprived, this is using uh, classical machine learning, so it's using simply random forest um, and a massive amount of, of, of features, image features, um, uh, like Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and also some additional features. Um, there's a lot of studies also looking into fitting the perception of, uh, of people on the ground and, and trying to see how much we can capture the best uh, compared to the worst area, and this uh, is using deep learning models. Mm -hmm. um, there's hopefully soon a paper coming out on this topic. Um, and then we have been using a lot on um, mapping, um, a building, building footprint mapping, because they are often uh, important sort of base layer for calculating other metrics, like morphological metrics. And they are pre-trained models, which were trained in um, from like other data, data set, typically like unit type of architectures are used. Um, and training them, particularly um, adding, particularly training data on slums, uh, because they're typically, that's what you see when you look to the Google Google data set or Microsoft data set, they're sort of performing okay, but in the deprived urban areas, they are totally off. And this has to do often that you don't have good training data set for these areas available because they're complex to generate. And we have been doing some experiments in Nairobi also together with local inhabitants um, digitizing and um, which happened again to be improved to really feed it into a training model. Um, so there are a lot of, so I stop, I'm stopping, I think. Okay, uh, but thanks a lot, uh, Monica. I think maybe the next speaker will also touch upon some technical 
aspects of maybe using machine learning. But uh, yes, I would like to move to our next speaker, Giulio Pedrosoli. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Claudio. I'll just sh share my screen here. Just a minute, please. And... Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. All right. So, <clears throat> good morning or or good evening to everybody. It depends on your time zone. It's a huge pleasure to be here and share this time with you. It's um, I'm very happy. So um, I will show a little bit of an analysis of the urban, the private areas expansion in Brazil between 1985 and 2020 using the data that we produced in the Map Biomas project by analyzing the spatial overlap of the annual urbanization maps with the official Brazilian the private areas boundaries. They are defined here uh, as substandard agglomerations and they are produced and released by the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics. So my presentation will be based on that. And well, map, I will talk a little bit about Map Biomas itself. It's a network of NGOs, startup technologies companies and universities that produce the annual land cover and use mapping for the entire Brazilian territory. The network workflow is based on four common pillars, which are remote sensing time series, including Landsat, Sentinel-2 and Planet Scope processing the, da the data pixel by pixel with the objective of not analyzing the trajectory of each pixel to tell the story of the Brazilian territory for each one of them, and the use of match learning and artificial intelligence. Currently, all maps produced by map biomas are made using the random forest and unit algorithms, so as Claudio said, and we operate in a kind of decentralized way using cloud computing resources and allocating the classification process on the Google Earth Engine platform, and I think someone also mentioned Google Earth Engine. So um, the production of that uh, data by Map Biomas Brazil is divided into biomes, right? We have five big biomes, Amazon, Caatinga, Cerrado, Atlantic Rainforest, Pampa, and Pantanal in the south part of Brazil, and where each one has a specialized team working on it. And besides, we have four other cross-coding cross teams, which includes the mapping of pasture lands, agriculture and irrigation, coastal zone, mining, and of course, urban areas, the one I am here coordinating and the results I'm gonna show you. And well, we generate maps to uh, three different levels of aggregation in the collection six, we work in, in collections. So we produce finishing the collection seven right now, collection six, for example, uh, 85 to 2020, you have 27 dis distinct classes at the high highest level of detail, as you can see here in our legend. So this is basically the land use land cover map for Brazil that we produce. And so how do we make the urban area maps after all? Well, we start by building what we call um, annual mosaics. In this case, the landsat scenes from 85 on are processed to remove clouds and shadows. And from that, we generate an annual reference image by calculating the median of the stack of images. Each biome uh, or team applies different rules to its mosaics. So some classify all observations individually, others use half yearly mosaics, etc. So the technical aspects of the mosaics may vary among network members, but all follow the same basic logic to produce an image by year. To train the classifier for urban areas, we use a set of more than 1.5 million samples for the urban areas, about 1.1 million for urban, and about 350,000 for no urban areas. So they are collected from external reference data, such as official Brazilian government maps, state and local inventories, and also produced by visual interpretation of very high resolution images. Each sample we assign, it's assigned year by year, indicating its interannual stability or change throughout the entire time series. So the maps of urban areas are made by applying the random forest algorithm, and the result is said to produce the probability map here. So in the probability map, we apply two types of filters. The first type are spatial filters, which validate the pixel as urban if it presents a minimum probability of being urban 
while also present predefined thresholds for the presence of night lights that we take from VIR satellite, VIR sensor, and population. The collection six, we use the word pop uh, settlement layer. If a pixel is accepted as urban, then we analyze the pixel clusters where the holes with a size less than 20 pixels are, uh, or the clusters with um, uh, less than 30 pixels together are eliminated. So basically we combine erosion and dilation in this in one of part of these spatial filters. The second filter is what we call the temporal filter. We assume that in the time series, a pixel will be valid as urban on the temporal frequency in two defined windows of three and five pixels in the time series, kind of sequentially, looking in the center pixel. So the center pixel, two of them, five of them. And if the mode of the class is the of the class in the time window before and after is urban, it stays urban. Otherwise, it will class class reclassifies as not urban. And the same is true for the non-urban pixel also. Uh, for all pixels validated as urban, we assume that once a pixel becomes urban, it does not recede. So a temporal accumulation function is applied at the end. So it's a valid. So if a pixel is validated as urban, it will be urban from that point on in, in our time series. The final data enters the integration process with the other teams and biomes in Mapbiomas, uh, where it will be compared, incorporated to the general map of Mapbiomas. And from there, the statistics and transitions are calculated. So just a number, the accuracy estimated for the urban areas uh, are, uh, are done using a set of external validation points. We have approximately, approximately eight, uh, uh, eight, five thousand points produced and checked by a validation team dedicated. We calculate consumer and producer's accuracy, which will be precision and recall in statistical terms. And these calculations are publicly accessible together with the codes and data. I can give you the links after the presentation. We also estimate the accuracy locally with a third source of samples points, sample points like global and settlement layers and, and to some years in the time series. Uh, just to, to have an idea, the overall accuracy of the urban areas in collection six of MacBiomas was 94% uh, basically. So in addition, uh, two other features of the method, are, the method are important to mention. The first one is that the classifiers, it's on, the classifier is on, only applied uh, to regions with high probability of urbanization presence. So we call these search areas. And of course, this increases the, the efficiency of the algorithm because each year, if you take just a single band Landsat image to in the entire Brazilian territory, it's about 9.5 billion pixels. So you multiply, you can imagine how much data it is. And the second thing is that training and classification is done in smaller parts and then glued together. So each model is trained, trained and applied into smaller regions, more or less 500 of them. Uh, which are the Brazilian cartographic divisions, official divisions. So we don't transfer the learning to very long regions. They are kind of local models. This is why we run the classification for urban areas. What, what's cool about it is that that data allows us to understand a little bit of the Brazilian uh, urbanization process in space and time over the last four decades. For example, uh, urbanized areas in Brazil occupy approximately 0.5% of the whole Brazilian territory, but this is just half of the area occupied by sugarcane plantations. Of course, Brazil is huge, 0.5% of this enormous area, it's a lot of thing, but it's half of the sugarcane, for example. And in general, we can see that the urbanized area grew at an average height higher than the population in Brazil. So urban areas in Brazil is still spreading out, as you can see here, the, the, the urban sprout is quite huge. And, but it varies a lot, especially. So the urban areas in the Amazon region, for example, grew a much higher rate than in the Atlantic forest region. This one much more consolidated. Uh, in this uh, time series. So when you look to the Amazon here, when we look to the Atlantic rainforest here, the Amazon is getting urban much faster than the Atlantic forest in the last four decades. And well, so the question is, we have the general data on the dynamics of the Brazilian urbanized area, but how did these dynamics happen when you look specifically at the, the private urban areas? This is an important question. 
To answer this, or try to answer this, we analyzed the increase in urbanized areas within the limits of the substandard agglomerations, which is the official mapping of favelas that was learned in Brazil, and compared the, the results with the urban expansion outside of these areas in the same period. So the substandard agglomerations are present in about 728 cities in Brazil with a total of more, more than, than 13, 13 thousand uh, polygonals uh, circumscribing them. And this is the proxy for the private areas that we are using in our analysis. And the subnormal agglomerations are updated approximately every 10 years, close to the demographic census. The definitions of uh, this, this, these areas uh, in updates on, on these areas impact the change of their limits by the Brazilian Institute of Geogra Geography and Statistics, because like here in the image, you can see an example of the changes of the limits for a region in the city of Salvador de Bahia, the state of Bahia. In the blue, uh, you are seeing uh, these limits in 2010 and how they are now in red 2020. But the definition of substandard agglomeration is also linked to land, land ownership. Changes of this type signif significantly impact their boundaries, which also points to one of the biggest limitations of this kind of, kind of data, but it's the official one, the one who covers the, the entire account. So, so for the analysis uh, presented here, I am using the limits defined in 2020. And so basically we calculate the evolution of the areas inside and outside the subnormal agglomerations and the trajectory of the pixels for both cases. Uh, this type of analysis allowed us to evaluate some questions such as, is there a difference between the growth, total growth and growth rate of urbanized areas inside and outside the, inside the private areas? Or where in the Brazilian territory are the, the private areas growing the most and the fastest? Or even are the private areas the ones that have grown the most over native vegetation? In other words, is the idea that urban informality is more aggressive to, to, to the environment in terms of deforestation, is, is, is this idea supported by the data? So uh, let's take a look what you have here. Using it, some interesting things came up. So looking to the aggregated data by states, the Brazilian states, the state of Pará in the Amazon region, you know, the Amazon forest, what you guys know, are, has more increase in the private areas than the states of Sao Paulo in the last 36 years. In Sao Paulo is by far the most urbanized area historically. Also in the Amazon uh, region, the state of Amazonas, both are the biggest states in the Amazon area, uh, come closer to Sao Paulo in terms of quantity of the private areas expansion in 36 years. And what calls our attention in this, for example, is that the state of Pará grew four times less in formal areas than Sao Paulo. So it's kind of a huge number. Many other states in the north and northeast uh, of Brazil tend to follow the same path as Pará and Amazonas in the time series. And in short, the, the private areas in Brazil have grown by the equivalent of 95,000 uh, soccer fields to compare, or like 11 times the size of the city of Lisbon in Portugal in, in 36 series is a huge area. And Still looking to the aggregates by states, if you consider the growth of the private areas proportionally to the total growth of urbanized areas, the situation in Amazonas stands out very strongly. As you can see here, you can see this huge bar at the left is the Amazonas state. And, but the occurrence of the private areas tends to be more concentrated in the state capitals and metropolitan regions. So when you look at the totals, in these cities, cities like Manaus and Belém, the capitals of Amazonas and Pará, have had almost half of their urban expansion in this, the last four decades inside the private areas. Half of the city grew deprived. So urban informality is more like a rule than an exception in the north part of Brazil in the last four decades, according our data. So considering that the boundaries of substandard agglomerations are limited by their definition, as we saw before, when we include other reference-based maps, such as the spatial interest zones, we call it ZAYS in Brazil, presented in the master plan of the cities, these growth proportions of the private, the private areas tend to, to increase even more. Here you can see an example in Salvador de Bahia, when including the, the ZAYS, the proportion of growth in, of the private areas jumps from 31% to 42% if we use this other complementary reference. And thus, 
the data provides evidence that we have two very distinct portraits of Brazilian urbanization that uh, when we look from the perspective of formal urbanization or from the perspective of uh, the private areas, it's a kind of a new portrait of how to look in the urban data. This is why this, this data we are producing is so important. Uh, we observe, for example, that regions uh, in the country uh, with older consolidation of the private areas, the black square here, um, in part of the country is in a kind of a transition of occupation of the, the, the private areas, more, more than half of the, the occupation occur after 85. And there is a very big part here where most of the, the private areas emerge after uh, 1985. So we can see how spatially and temporally diverse the private areas in Brazil are. And since it's possible to establish the trajectory of each pixel into the private areas, we can calculate what total areas have grown over native vegetation, for example. Overall, the, full, the formal urban expansion has deforestated much more than the, than the, the private areas, obviously because they are numerically larger. But when we get to Manaus and Belém, for example, cities where the growth of the private areas was almost half of the total growth, they were responsible for less than a half of the urban occupation in native vegetation. So as you can see here in green squares, Manaus and Belém, most of the occupation of vegetation it was done by formal urbanization, not by the private areas. So this raise important questions like being formal apparently does not guarantee better or less predatory urbanization in Brazil. This is what our data suggests. And, but we, we still have many limitations, of course. The reference data cannot represent all the private areas in Brazil. The Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics itself, uh, in a different survey, when they asked to the municipality if they have slums, about more than 1,000 of them say yes, but they are just mapping 710 weight. So where, where are the other slums? We, are, we cannot see yet. So it's a big challenge uh, where we are still facing is to complement these databases with satellite image classification. From this, we have new perspectives like deep learning and, and so on. And I'm sure Professor Claudio and Professor Monica can help us a lot with that. But this is just a briefly introduction of how we are ana analyzing the dynamics of the private areas in Brazil from Matthew Gilmas data. And to finish, thank you very much for your attention. And thanks also to the team that contributed to the urban mapping in Matthew Gilmas Collection 6. And thank you, Claudio. Thanks a lot, uh, Julia. Great to see all these activities on the Brazilian side and uh, the activity of Map Biomas. Very interesting. In the interest of time, I would go to the next speaker for today, and we can then uh, have a Q&A session at the end. So I would like to invite Dennis to go ahead with the presentation. Thank you very much, Claudio. And I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. It's great to be here and also to learn from uh, the, the stories of Brazil and also the great work that Monica is uh, doing with Tim. Uh, so I'm just sharing my screen. Okay, please uh, let me know when you can see my screen in full mode. Yes, perfect, it's visible. Okay, okay. so uh, I'm going to have a, a very simple, uh, non-complex uh, presentation, uh, like the ones made by Monica and uh, Julio. Uh, and yeah, I, I just want to talk uh, slightly about the SDG 11.1.1 uh, that focuses on the uh, informal settlement and uh, explain the method that we are using currently to measure uh, this uh, indicator, but also the connections to the use of application and use pressure information for increased or better indicator. But also show some of the images between uh, us, what we've done in the global, what uh, institutions like the cloud to or they already contribute to increase the measurement of the, the indicator. So <clears throat> the, the background is 
the the target uh, eleven point one point one one is uh, one of the indicator targets within the SDG eleven. That deals with the sustainable cities and human settlements. Uh, and uh, it, what it is does it seeks to ensure that by 2030, uh, there's uh, access to all, for all to adequate, uh, safe, affordable housing and basic services and upgrading of slums. Uh, this target is, is a continuation of uh, the, the Millennium Development Goal Target 7D uh, that sought to ensure by 2030, 2020, that uh, there was significant improvement in the lives of uh, 100 million slum dwellers. So how we are measuring the progress towards this target is uh, through one indicator, indicator 11. 0.1.1 uh, that measures the proportion of urban population that is living in slums, informal settlements, uh, or inadequate housing. So this uh, indicator has three uh, uh, concepts. So the slum concept, the informal settlement concept, and also the inadequate housing concept that I'll be talking uh, uh, more in the next slides. <clears throat> and, and the goal, it's, of course, the target is also connected to other goals, particularly within SDG 11 or SDG 1 uh, on uh, access to basic services, but also security of okay. So the three concepts that I mentioned, slums, informal settlements, and inadequate housing, uh, how we measured and define this concept uh, is based on deprivations. Uh, Monica alluded to this. And uh, what, what we look at, uh, the current method of measuring the slum indicator, it's uh, uh, using seven uh, types of deprivations at the household level. Uh, the first one is access to water, uh, improved water specifically, uh, the, and that uh, definitions, of course, the different types of uh, improved water, like um, uh, water that is uh, from safe uh, sources. Uh, we also look at the component for access to improved sanitation. Uh, a, a component for sufficient living area uh, that also looks at uh, crowding, overcrowding in the house. And particularly this one looks at uh, if more than three people are, uh, are living in, in one room, uh, then that, uh, that unit is considered to be uh, overcrowded. We also look at things like uh, the structural quality of the housing and durability uh, and the location of the houses. Uh, security of tenure, uh, and this is something uh, that we I think already alluded to, and it's one of the key definitional components. Uh, and security of tenure here involves the uh, security of tenure of the land, uh, but also the unit where people live. So you could have uh, security, you could have a title deed for where you are plotted, but you could also have a deed for the, your house, and also be if have the feeling of safety uh, when you have like a rental agreement uh, for the house that you live in. The, the other components include affordability. Uh, that uh, particularly this one is very specific for the aspect of inadequate housing. Accessibility, uh, being able to access your housing unit without complications and also cultural adequacy. And again, uh, the one appreciation for this housing indicator is that uh, different contexts and different cultures have uh, different standards to housing. Uh, and a house perhaps than in bamboo in one country could uh, mean that that is an improved housing that in another country that could also could not be counted as a uh, housing that meets the, the, the thresholds for uh, for being uh, structurally sound uh, in that context. So here we look at uh, the cultural adequacy for the specific context in which uh, we are measuring this. So for in terms of the measuring, we combine the slums and the informal settlements because uh, you, as you can see from the screen, the, the, it looks at the five aspects there that it looks at are uh, almost similar. Then uh, the, the one for inadequate housing because it has three additional uh, aspects that are not measured under the slums and informal settlements. Uh, what we look for, particularly for this one, is the affordability. Uh, and uh, for the sake of measuring for this uh, SDG, uh, the, a house is considered to be affordable if the household's uh, expenditure, uh, the net uh, of, of expenditure on housing, does not exceed 30 percent of the total net monthly income uh, of, of that household. Uh, so this is something that uh, is, is what we are using uh, to measure. And part of the reason for this is also because uh, data availability for a lot of the other uh, criteria or characteristics that are uh, required to measure uh, the affordability like cultural adequacy uh, are not also very readily available. <clears throat> so in terms of how, how the indicator is computed, it's computed as a composite uh, in, uh, index of uh, uh, the different deprivation, uh, looking at uh, the, the proportion of the house uh, 
course, we do with the one distribution, two distribution, three distribution, four, five distributions for the slums and informal settlements. As I mentioned, we combine these two. Then we look at the proportion of the population that does not have all lives in households uh, that, that uh, do not uh, meet the housing affordability threshold. Uh, it's just a simple formula here showing you the, the measurement. Uh, so to measure a single deprivation is what you look at the, uh, if the, the share of uh, house population with, within households which lack uh, one deprivation or a certain deprivation is a proportion of the total population within the city or the area that uh, is of interest. So this could be at the city level, uh, but also could be at even a neighborhood level depending on the data availability. Uh, and the same applies for the uh, measurement for the population with, access, uh, with, with uh, inadequate access to inadequate housing rather. So uh, and a few things to note about uh, this and here I want to also connect to the other observation your spatial measurements, uh, which uh, we are discussing today. Uh, uh, the household deprivation measurements uh, pose several challenges. Uh, and, and perhaps also leave a few gaps that uh, our observation and your spatial information is uh, currently helping us to start feeling. Uh, the first one is that uh, in many countries, uh, data is not collected uh, for informal settlements and slums because some countries also, I think uh, Julio was talking about that uh, people say they're in slums, but in actual sense, the question is where are these slums? Uh, so yeah, in, in other countries, they actually uh, I, I say that they don't have slums, so they cannot actually report the uh, statistics on slums. Uh, and because official data, of course, always comes from the countries, uh, there's not much we can do. The one great thing that we've seen with the most recent round of census is we are having a lot of countries collecting geocode data, and this data gets attached to, to specific houses and they can have the attribute on the uh, deprivations themselves but also the location of this house, even as we move towards the identifying of the settlements, uh, which uh, have uh, informality characteristics, as uh, Monica was showing, uh, we the future looks quite interesting because we'll be able to compare this data at the household level with whether that neighborhood or that area is uh, can be classified as informal. Uh, the other, the other, the other component from from the current household data uh, that we use is in, in cases where we use the surveys uh, such as the DHS and mix service, Sometimes the sampling procedures do not also divide uh, or classify the formal and uh, informal settlements. So, uh, but rather in many cases we we'll look at the rural urban uh, as collective. So also getting detailed information on these places is uh, still remains a challenge. Of course, we have obvious challenges with information on security of tenor. Many countries do not uh, collect this information at the micro level uh, and even at the city scale, uh, the national level is also difficult to find this information uh, and not even to mention the, the issues to do with affordability. So <clears throat> uh, this presents uh, measure, the challenges of measurement of this indicator at the household level. Uh, then uh, the last one, which is very important, uh, in many cases, when we have discussions with countries, uh, perhaps based on the data from the center is the one thing could happen is show 50% of population in a city lives in informal settlements. And then uh, the question always comes back to ask, so where are these uh, slums in informal settlements? Uh, can we see them or at least can uh, this data help us to understand them? And that leads us to the question now on the role of ad observation and uh, geospatial analysis to identify this. Yeah, I just want to put uh, to, to show uh, an illustration from a publication from 2020 that Monica and, uh, and other colleagues also participated in. So based on the household deprivations, you can have different things. So you can have a household uh, that is identified as uh, being uh, informal, uh, within a place that actually has the characteristics of formal. So here I just want to show the, uh, in the in the B there, <clears throat> if, if you look at B, you, you can see this neighborhood perhaps in, in a manner of speaking, uh, looks to be formal, it's organized, uh, but you could have a household, one household that uh, does not have a, a certain deprivation, so it doesn't have improved water sanitation or doesn't have the security of China. So that household, while it might be with in a, a neighborhood that is not informal can actually be classified as an informal housing. The same, the opposite can also happen where you have 
uh, Ashanti uh, neighborhood where you have actually a house so that uh, maybe the owners have uh, developed or improved their housing and they have access to all the basic services. So that creates uh, uh, that, that kind of uh, gap between the, the, the settlement typology and the individual household typology. Uh, and the other one is where, of course, you have the households uh, which live in places that are obviously uh, informal uh, in character. Uh, again, here yeah, linking to what Monica was showing about the mapping activities. So uh, in, in order to improve then how the linkage between the household data and the uh, settlement identification, one thing that uh, we have been working and also promoting very much at UN Habitat is uh, to move towards uh, a more settlement-based uh, um, analysis and to cross-validate the information that we produce from uh, the household deprivations with the identification of the settlements. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, as Monica was talking about, uh, the, the different context uh, in which uh, slums and informal settlements manifest and Claudio I think also was talking about something very interesting where uh, like in Brazil uh, things might not be as bad in terms of the housing quality uh, but uh, the security of China would be complex. And here, just showing different contexts with, from Nigeria to India to Kenya to South Africa to Zambia. In some places, the houses are good, but the spatial organization is, on, is, is not very clear. Some places are very organized, the, the China security is not uh, well defined, or is, is, uh, this is not, uh, is not clear. And those, all these bring complexity in terms of what analysis really needs to be done. <laughs> and the conclusion here is, uh, as Monica said, there is uh, mostly no one model that fits uh, everything uh, that can actually be applied across all the countries. And there's a lot of need to engage uh, at different levels with different stakeholders to actually measure this. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are very happy that uh, uh, with the continued uh, activities of uh, research institutions, uh, scientific uh, community, uh, 20 years, uh, University of 20, uh, there's a lot of activity happening in this uh, uh, domain of uh, slum mapping. And this actually feeds directly to our uh, aspiration to actually use more other observation-based measurements uh, to be able to produce uh, not just information on slums and informal settlements, but also to be able to show where these settlements are and link this to specific actions. One action area where you know that is also keenly working on is uh, to uh, promote the identification of severities uh, in different uh, informal settlements and uh, types of settlements within uh, within the city. Uh, so that actions uh, would be incremental depending on the, how severe uh, the situation is within each of these uh, settlements. So for example, you could have a settlement where with, within uh, one side of the settlement, you actually have uh, five, six deprivations or so six conditions which are very severe. And if you are to do an upgrading program, then uh, you uh, the city could prioritize uh, which should they focus on the entire settlement or those places where the severities are much more uh, severe and there as, as compared to others uh, other areas uh, the the we working with the european space agency also we also we are happy that uh, at least now we are getting uh, out uh, seriously research in this field so that uh, there is much more uh, official method that can actually be a development finalized for application at the global level. And this, uh, I know a lot of activities happening in this domain and in the next year or so we expect at least to have something that is concrete uh, that can be rolled out at uh, least in different countries uh, and also showcasing these differences. The, the other thing I want to mention is also one of the challenges we've had previously was the, <clears throat> the acceptability of the uh, observation measurements into official statistics. And within the SDG framework, we've actually happy because uh, there are specific requirements for use of ad observation uh, as a key contributor to the measurements for the indicators. And uh, here uh, within the SLAM domain is also one of those uh, indicators with a lot of potential to use ad observation based uh, measurements to uh, inform the data data production, but also linked to the specific action. The last thing I want to say here is uh, that uh, related to informalities, uh, obviously, I think uh, uh, we also mentioned this, informalities sometimes uh, there's a lot of connections to what is happening in the entire city. So as a city expands or as a city densifies or intensifies, uh, then uh, the results could be informalization of some areas. Uh, so within the largest uh, SDG framework is, is not about looking at one indicator separately, but 
but actually looking at all the indicators and seeing how different things are connected and then using the results from this to make informed decisions and actions that no one and no place is left behind. Again, just to emphasize that there is a big network of actors uh, within the earth observation community and the UN agencies that is working uh, on the use of earth observation and just special information for measuring SDG 11. And you are again welcome to have a look at the Earth Observation Toolkit to see what uh, we are doing and, and what is available from this uh, from this uh, toolkit. And with that, thank you very much. And back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, for your presentation. You showed quite clearly with several examples the complexity of the problem. And Earth's observation can help, but uh, it, it's clear from the several examples that satellite images are not enough. One needs to have uh, additional data from coming uh, from local communities and other sources of information. I see we are already exceeding the one hour that we have planned for the webinar, but I would ask the speakers if they are happy to stay a little bit longer and also all the participants, if they are interested in the topic, please stay with us for uh, some 10, 15 minutes more so we can have a discussion on all this. Um, I saw a few questions, uh, but I would like to maybe start with one, um, to, one question to Dennis. Um, because I, I think um, I would like to understand a little bit better from the perspective of uh, you inhabited, what could be a, a, a better involvement from the remote sensing community? What can we do better to contribute to a better understanding of urban deprivation? How can we do better in having an impact on, on this societal problem and of course, uh, possibly achieving the, the SDG 11 in the end. Yes, uh, sure, sure, Claudia. So uh, for me, I'd say we actually, the hand observation community is already doing quite a bit uh, and uh, there's a lot of activity, I say the last uh, five years or so to actually support the measurement of SDG 11 at, at large. There hasn't been much uh, in particular interest to the measuring the privations, but uh, as I said, I'm happy that uh, this uh, investment coming in, uh, at least in this field, at the global level to actually try to do more. I, I know the, the fear and, and also the interest in many ways from the other observation community has been automation of processes. And since in this field, there is not, uh, not things don't work the same. So sometimes you have to get a lot of context specific uh, studies and understand different contexts. Uh, perhaps uh, we've had the small scale interventions also linking to the kind of input data that has been required. So I know like, for example, with very high resolution imagery, we have uh, quite a number of small scale projects. And the challenge as in my view has been, how do we scale this up so that uh, we talk about a global scale of activity. Uh, I, I know it's still a challenge uh, because of the sometimes the resolution of data needed to understand the very small uh, settlement specific uh, uh, what is happening uh, but but I, I i am confident that with the momentum that is already happening uh, quite a bit uh, can happen and, and within the toolkit of course we we also have a specific uh, focus area or focus uh, work stream on looking at the contributions to housing and uh, informality uh, aspects okay thanks one maybe a curiosity i don't know if you are able to comment on uh, how much at the current state Earth observation data are used for, for instance, the reporting on the indicator 1111. What is the status at the operational level in terms of usage of remote sensing? So all, all the things that let's say as a scientific community are we working on, how much is picked up for, operational reporting. 
Yes, definitely. I mean, from from uh, from where I am, I, and also looking at us, all the data we have, I can tell you, I I don't know any case or any country that is using our observation to report on uh, this indicator, <laughs> and okay. unfortunately, unfortunately. So that's, but, that's but of course I uh, I said news for us, and then what needs to be done to make sure to to yeah, to foster collaboration between uh, between researchers, scientific community, local communities, and stakeholders and organizations like yours, to um, yeah encourage the use of of this technology as much as it it's, it helps, of course. Yeah, you I, I, I think. Yes, I, I'd say I say one action that uh, could be uh, workable is that so far we've not had like uh, a universal method through which we can actually measure the informalities consistently, because I mean, as Monica said, as uh, William said, it's it's, uh, it's very context specific. Sometimes even within the same country, one city is very different from another city. And like uh, measuring other indicators, say like 11.3.1, where you only need to extract the built up area for the entire area and use that as the input for the indicator measurement. So the, the one very specific contribution that the other observation community can make to this is maybe more research in this and actually so that we have a method that is clear in terms of the, its application across uh, across the board. Even if you have to make modification, just needs to be very clear that this is how you go about it. These are the considerations you make at the local level, and also prove uh, this. Uh, many many countries actually, they at least from our experience, they they buy into what they actually can see is working. Uh, so it's, it's uh, if if you can actually prove and show that uh, this works in different contexts within the same country or in different contracts across countries and then this becomes more accepted and it becomes of becomes an official way of measuring so here i think there's a lot of a lot of space for for the community yeah. to actually do something okay i think that, that really the complexity of of the problem and the different areas in the world and so on and all these differences i think uh, are a big obstacle to make like a universal or a standard approach to to address this problem because i think that would be something very useful for uh, operationalizing this uh, slum mapping activities but uh, i guess um, i think maybe uh, working towards uh, okay talking about standards or that, that's difficult but maybe some guidelines that could be a, gu a guiding how to how to approach maybe i would like to ask uh, julio uh, because i mean the activity of of uh, bio biome map um, biomas is is very interesting and it's really um, related for mapping of urban areas in the whole country of brazil um, uh, do you think uh, this project i mean it's it's operational right can the data be used for the national reporting? Is it used or is it planned to be used somehow in that context? Yeah, it, it's like actually the, the, the data was produced originally because of greenhouse gases uh, effect. So we need to, to look at the land change to understand how much uh, greenhouse effect of gases we are producing. This is what uh, this is how map biomas originally came up, but then it grew up and the urban areas was not an important thing on, on, on it because if, when you look to Brazil, the cities are not the biggest player in terms of pollution and this kind of stuff. It's actually pasture and agriculture and, and burning and, and, and this kind of stuff. But uh, since we start to work on, on, on urban mapping, uh, we brought some attention to it. And especially because of we somehow we point out that the, the private areas are, are growing up and nobody is actually looking into it in a, in a constant way like this we are trying to do. And it's probably using for reporting, for example, uh, not the urban data itself, but I can give you some examples like the deforestation data, the banks in mm -hmm. Brazil, 
and some local banks or even international banks, they use the deforestation data to give money for the producers or not. It's one more thing. They, they gather data, put on the system, and they, they look into the documentation. And if it, there's some evidence of deforestation, they cannot access the money. They have to prove that they have the permits to, 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 to take out the, the, the vegetation and, and their property. So this is something, but for urban areas, uh, we don't see something like this happening now, right? It, it, it's being incorporated in the local uh, governments or, or in the, the local process of decision-making, but it's something that we, we are planning, planning because this is how we make with Mapping Biomas data. We produce it, but all the data we produce, it's, it's being used for someone, for the banks, or even the, the national government is using it for different things and especially now we have like historically low budgets on mapping in the brazilian territory we call our national institute institute of space research INPE. it's very low money actually so we are kind of complementing the the data production for them and if if it was not map biomas maybe we are we we would be facing some um lacking of uh, mapping information in brazil right now so mm -hmm. i think we need to improve a little bit more the urban mapping areas in brazil to make it suitable for this kind of things like dennis is describing but we, we're just starting with it is this uh, this is the first collection that we produced of urban mapping we're going we're thinking how we're going to improve it and probably the, the the private areas will be part of it will be a class inside of it so we need to talk a little bit more how with you and Monica how to to, to solve this problem, but th this is the goal, ultimate goal. Thanks, thanks, great. Um, I would like to invite also the audience uh, to to ask questions uh, and participate in this discussion. I I, I see there was a question uh, that was posted uh, in the beginning. I think this is. Uh, for Monica, it's about uh, when working with the local communities, do you also incorporate qualitative data from the community in your Earth observation data? Um, in, in a way, yes, because uh, let's say when we um, trying to, to map um, the variations of deprivation, so we, we are trying to model which area are perceived as less uh, less less compared to more deprived? Um, so we 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 have like uh, we do this um of recent uh, sort of pilot we had in Nairobi um is we 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 make people comparing our pairs to say what is more deprived and what is less, and this generates a massive amount of training data, which we can then fit to a deep learning model on using Earth observation data. Can be sort of um train a model to 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 reflect or to be able to reproduce the perception of people and how consistent is the perception of people of what is more and less deprived and of course there's variation but there's overall let's say you see very clear patterns of what is about this um what is more and what is less deprived which has to do with the location inside the settlement with uh, being close to, 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 to infrastructure, being uh, more low density built up, having more green spaces, um, also um, aspects of the urban morphology, etc. And that's all what then in the end you can basically um, sort of um, extract also from, 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 from earth observation data because these are, uh, even though they are individual perception, they, they are sort of converged to something you can uh, map in with earth observation data. Mm -hmm. um maybe a, a, a final thought about um the sort of the problem of of transferability and that's um at least within idea maps we what we are trying to do is we build this massive data system of various aspects of deprivation and yes uh, thermal uh, surface temperature as the are there uh, night lights etc so there are a massive amount of of, of covariates or indicators um, and basically, this allows local users to switch on and switch off indicators, which are more relevant for the location. So you build up massive data systems, which allow to be locally tailored. I see. Okay. So it's kind of fine-tuned locally 
yes. where you can give a different importance to different yes. covariates. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have also maybe going a little bit more into the technical aspects, uh, talking about transferability. Uh, 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 Julio, you presented uh, the, the way it works in uh, map biomas, the model, and I understood that models are trained locally, right? I think you showed these slides where you had a subdivision with these hexagons. And um, did, you, did you check whether, I mean, uh, you could, I mean, is this the proper way to subdivide the problem, because I'm not sure it's only geographical that uh, the, the way that makes conditions similar, right? Because the assumption that is within a hexagon, you assume that one model will be suitable and not suitable to the next one because you have to retrain it because conditions changes. Can you elaborate a little bit more on these in terms of transferability? Yeah, exactly. We subdivide the training and the, classif the classification process inside, not, not the hexagon. The hexa there are some hexagons inside uh, uh, a square. So it's a bigger square with lots of mm -hmm. hexagons inside it, uh, approximately 500 squares. That the official mapping system in Brazil, the, the, the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics provide. But this is due not because our first choice. This is the kind of the original original structure of map biomas. We can change it. Mm -hmm. We can choose okay. different aspects of it. Are, this is the first attempt, and we decide that in the case of urban, when you look at the guys that that are mapping Amazon, they are not using anything like this. They are uh, classifying all the images individually, and then mm -hmm. they process it uh, the, the time series yearly and extract the, the best pixel of the classification. They kind of a stepwise random forest process. They apply random forest and all the image, then they apply the random forest and all the classification image to decide if it's or not. And there's different ways, but in our case, we decide to use this grid, the IBGE grid, but you can change it. We are not sure, we are, we are experimenting it. And it, it works quite well in terms of urban areas when you calculate the user consumer's accuracy, user accuracy, but maybe, maybe not. I'm sure you're right. We need to look into different ways to organize the training and the classification process. We just need to understand a little bit more. You know, it's a huge territory yeah. and huge differences in just to detect single class like urban areas, we are, we are, we are failing in a lot of parts in Brazil. We cannot detect all the cities. It's, it's quite hard. And to detect inside of the cities, the, the private areas is another challenge. So. Yeah, uh, uh, we don't know yet. We are we're, we're, we're experimenting, and maybe we can talk a little bit uh, more early about it. Yeah, sure. I was just wondering. You know, I am uh, into deep learning. I do research in in deep learning. Uh, do you think? Um, uh, I mean, you you could uh, have any gain in performance and maybe transferability by using deep learning instead of random forest. Have you looked into that for? Yeah, we are using not for the urban class. We're using for mining and probably Luis Cortina is the guy who are visiting you. He's working with the, the mining mapping in Brazil. They are using deep learning and it works quite well, but they, but they use the same logic. There are search areas, very small search areas, much smaller than, than the urban areas to improve the classification process and so on. But the case is for deep learning, the structure, we are discussing a lot how to implement a large scale deep learning processing because it's the entire Brazilian territory, 37 years in this collection right now, each single band for Landsat's 9.5 billion pixels and we have, it, we have more than a hundred bands on our feature space. For example, I, I don't show you the feature space but it's a huge feature space mm -hmm. and so, uh, it's not not so easy for mining. It's a little bit easier because you have less mining areas than urban urban areas are more present than than mining areas. And we are trying to negotiate with Google and the partners and so on to implement it inside Google Earth Engine. We need a lot of space, and for deep learning, we are trying to use Sentinel two images, so it's much more data. Much mm -hmm. uh, it, it would be heavier and 
harder to process, but yeah, we are looking to it. We are making some tests, but we are not able at this point yet, but maybe next year to implement to the entire country. Let, let's see how the structure and the processing power of, uh, of Google Earth Engine will, will help us or not, but we are looking to it for sure. Okay, thanks. So more, more to come. I was, because also referring to the problem that Monica mentioned, uh, with the good deep learning model, convolutional networks, and nowadays with the uh, transformers and so on, one might think that indeed the model might learn, depending on the local area, what are the informative features. Of course, this could work with the drawback, I mean, with the expense of losing interpretability. It's always difficult then to say interpret uh, the, the, the predictions, of course. But in principle, this could be captured, let's say, and, and trained um, if sufficient and good quality training data are provided. Okay, I'm not sure I, if there are other questions from, uh, from the audience. I didn't... Okay. It's nice to see many, many nice comments in the chat. So that's great. It seems uh, the, the, the presentations were very well uh, received and there are a lot of people interested. So I guess that uh, this, uh, this webinar will spark maybe potentially collaborations and, and activities on, on this. Mm. I, I don't have further questions. And I, I think we are also 20 minutes after our time. Um, okay, so then I would like to, to close the webinar. I would like to thank very much the speakers also for staying a little bit longer for this uh, discussion and Q&A session. Thanks a lot. I think it was a very interesting, very insightful uh, webinar with different views, with different perspective of different organizations, different countries. And, and, and yeah, I think it's, it's very interesting. I hope this can um, yeah, somehow inspire new activities on this very important societal challenge. And it's clear we have to do more. It's clear we have to do more also to try to uh, foster more, uh, encourage the use of Earth observation data uh, in the context of the SDG. So it seems uh, there, there is space for more uh, work for the Earth observation community for better connecting maybe with stakeholders and other organizations. Thanks a lot to everybody. As I said in the beginning, we will have another webinar in about a month. So stay tuned. I think we will announce uh, the next uh, topic uh, in the coming days. Thanks a lot. Wish you all a very nice day. And thanks, Thank Claudio, for having us thanks, sharing Dennis. the session. Thank, Thank you very much. Monica, Dennis, Claudio. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And thanks, thanks for all the active questions and uh, remarks. Um, yeah. Really enjoyed the, uh, the session. Very good. Have a nice day.